in the 19th century, there were, there were uh, those who said, well, if, if we want to take lessons from evolution for how to run our society, we need what came to be known as social Darwinism. Mm -hmm. um, basically, just looking at evolution as, as nothing but you know, competition and with quite brutal results, but being sort of ultimately for the good. And some people would argue for sort of extreme free market uh, kind of economics as, as a result. Um, what do you see as kind of the legacy of, of that kind of thinking and that way of looking at evolution? I think that kind of thinking is still very much present in U.S. society. And, and, and I'm, of course, a European who comes here. Uh, I live already 25 years here. And I've become American. I'm, I'm one of you, so to speak. But still, when I came here, I was astonished by the, the level of social Darwinism in this country. Because uh, people will, will tell you, and you will never hear that in Europe, they will say, why should I pay for the education of somebody else? Why should I pay for the health care of somebody else? Now, you will never hear a European politician dare to say that on TV. Like, like for example, Kyle, a uh, senator from Arizona, I believe, who recently said that he didn't care so much for maternity care in the health bill because he'd never had any need for it himself. <laughs> uh, that, what kind of statements are that? So, so that, that kind of statements are, for me, uh, very surprising. And so in the book, I do pay some attention to social Darwinism because social Darwinism came up at about the same time that Darwin was there, uh, was promoted by Herb Spencer. And the idea was that since nature is based on competition and elimination of, of the weak by the strong, that's how you need to structure society. And so if the poor perish, that's fine because that's what the poor are supposed to do. In nature, that would happen too. And so uh, he promoted this idea of a very harsh, individualistic type of society modeled on nature. Now, the process of evolution is indeed a harsh process of uh, elimination. But what it has produced is a lot of animals like us who are highly social. And so a lot of animals actually survive by cooperation. And, and so what Herb Spencer didn't take that into account. Darwin had a much broader view. He saw, he saw that. But Spencer didn't take that into account, is that actually evolution has produced animals who live in societies for a reason uh, and who gain benefits from being together and working together. So, I mean, do you, do you see um, insights that we can draw from the natural world in terms of figuring out how to, how to run our own society? Or should, I mean, you know, Richard Dawkins, for example, has said, don't try to draw any lessons from nature because it's just brutal. We, we should create our own society according to you know, what we decide is right. Um, so if, if you find that social Darwinism doesn't work, what do you see as an alternative? No, uh, I, I do think you can draw lessons from what we know about human nature, so to speak. So, so let's say you have a zoo and you're designing enclosures for animals and your animal is nocturnal, you're going to make a different design than when the animal is diurnal, or the animal is a climber, or a digger, or whatever. You know, there's all sorts of ways of accommodating the needs of, which we call it actually, ecological needs of the animals in the zoo world. And in the same way, if you design, if you design a human society, you should say, well, what is human nature? Human, humans live in small families. That's one of the things we do. We, the family is the what is it, the cornerstone of society, as we say. Uh, humans are empathic, uh, uh, altruistic, cooperative, but they're also competitive and they're, they're incentive seeking. And so, and, and so you need to take all these factors into account, everything you know about human nature, and then you say, well, if, if we have a free hand, I don't think we do, but if we have a free hand in designing society, we should take all these tendencies into account. And so to structure a society basically entirely on competition and selfish motives, uh, as, for example, Enron, Enron Company tried to do that. I don't know if you know that story, but um, Jeff Skilling uh, was the CEO of Enron. He was a big fan of the selfish gene. He, he saw this was a wonderful book, and he decided to structure the society around, uh, what is it, fear and greed. Those were the two things. Fear and greed were the two things that motivated people, and that's how he was going to structure the society. And look at what good that has done for Enron and what good that has done for the country. And so uh, I do think 
you, you cannot derive from nature immediate direct lessons of this is what we should do in society, but I do believe that you need to take the nature of the beast into account when you design a society. And the nature of the human beast is much more complex than just greed and fear.